Hi everyone, this is Peter, um, Peter Beal, and I am going to talk for a few minutes about the subject of phobism and expressionism. These are important art movements uh, that pop up in European art, French and German art mostly, at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, they are one of a number of um, art styles, I guess, and associations that really set the trajectory for, I don't know, maybe the next 50 years or so in a lot of important ways uh, in uh, Western art in particular. In a nutshell, I think we can begin to think about phobism and expressionism as taking the next steps that were set in motion um, by the two strands, the broadly speaking, two strands of expressionism and formalism uh, in post-impressionism. We have looked a little bit at uh, artists such as Paul Gauguin or Vincent van Gogh on the sort of expressive side, and then um, Cezanne and Seurat for the formal side. So in a lot of ways, phobism, and we'll, we'll deal with that first, Phobism really takes some of the um, tendencies that, especially I would argue, uh, Paul Gauguin uh, uh, really gets started, especially the use of broad, flat um, areas of color, oftentimes arbitrary in nature, to really set aside or leave behind um, the sorts of traditional academic conventions of, for instance, modeling using light and shade or, you know, coming up with local color uh, equivalents for things they've, they're seeing in, in nature. It's, it's worth pointing out as we go into a discussion of phobism that they don't, phobists tend not to go into the realm of pure abstraction or non-representational art. Um, and so, again, I think the precedent of, of Paul Gauguin is is pretty important. Before we get started, I suppose it probably is a good idea to think a little bit about the idea, uh, the concept of the avant-garde, and to uh, outline a few basic principles. I think it's safe to say that by the time we come into, roughly speaking, 1900, the idea that the arts, and we'll just focus on visual art, but we see it elsewhere, we see it in drama, we see it in literature, we see it in music, that the arts are dissociating themselves from the need for public approval um, is a trend that's really begin to take hold, that artists are seeing themselves as, and this is where the term comes from, a kind of advanced scouting party uh, charting out the future. And it's a future that is not necessarily reassuring or comforting. Again, think of you know, an advanced scouting party for an army, sort of getting to lay the land and assessing the opposing forces and that kind of thing. Um, we can think of them also perhaps, and this is going to be an important metaphor in the 20th century, like scientists or researchers or explorers who are going out into the unfamiliar and, um, you know, bringing back a report, as it were. And, you know, sometimes that's good news and sometimes it's not, but the sense that it's not necessarily going to sit well with the general public is is a is a sense uh, that or a, a kind of foundational principle is really going to be important for thinking about twentieth century art. This undermines a lot of the standard institutions uh, that dealt with art at the time. In particular, of course, that a phenomenon that's been hanging in there through the um, uh, through the 19th century, but really by the 20th century is going to be, I think, dismissed by most as irrelevant. That, of course, is the Art Academy. Um, if we think, for instance, of the example of France, the Art Academy studied, started under the time of Louis XIII and XIV, um, particularly with an eye toward amplifying and um, you know broadcasting the magnificence of the French king and court, um, and then following that through to the time of the revolution where the academy acts as a kind of um, legitimizer, I suppose, of artistic talent and ability and 
you know, kind of seal of approval. Um, by the time we're going into the 1860s and 70s, that role is becoming more and more marginal. Um, Avant-garde artists, at, I think it's safe to say by this point, really don't have anything whatsoever to do with the French Art Academy or any of its, uh, for instance, exhibitions, the famous salons that um, the likes of Edouard Benet and, and so forth get rejected from. That basically, that all of that has been given up as irrelevant to the, um, you know, to the to the deeper goals of, of these artists. So the salon and the academy are increasingly irrelevant. Um, it's getting harder and harder to figure out the art market. Um, a number of these artists simply won't sell anything. Um, there's no market for the type of uh, art that they provide, or at least they won't sell it for a long time. Uh, I, I believe, for instance, with Vincent van Gogh, he may have sold two paintings in his relatively short life. Um, occasionally, um, artists will become very popular, very um, widely uh, loved, even after they were denounced in their youth as being uh, degenerate or, or whatever. I mean, a good example, like the piece that we're looking at right now, is the art of Henri Matisse, who starts off as a young rebel with this extraordinarily uh, vibrant and, um, in its own way, confrontational portrait. Um, the woman with the hat. Uh, this is a, a portrait of his wife. And it's Again, if we think about the conventions of portraiture, it's a sort of standard three-quarter portrait, the kind of thing in many ways that would be, you know, standard going back really to the uh, 17th century Dutch or perhaps even further back than that. Um, but the problem, and again, it's hard to see in contemporary eyes that we're used to this kind of art, I think quite a bit more than viewers in 1905 would have been, um, that the piece itself is really composed almost entirely of angular, flat, brilliant, unmodulated patches of bright color. Um, that it, the portrait itself seems almost designed to provoke a hostile response uh, from an, uh, you know, from an audience that's used to, um, let's just say, a more lifelike, more quote-unquote natural uh, and um, subtle and evocative type of use of color. Um, Matisse really basically lays it out. There's a, a great quote here. What characterized phobism was that we rejected imitative colors, that is to say local colors, the, you know, typical skin tones or hair color, what have you, and with pure colors obtained stronger reactions. So the sense of um, this animated, contrasting, vivid color caused um, at least one critic to describe them, and we have these great quotes from critics all the time in this period, to describe them as wild beasts, right? These, they're, they're untamed, they're outside the conventions of, again, the academy or typical um, modes of representation. So Mat Matisse is one of a number of artists, and these are mostly French artists, who take reasonably conventional uh, subjects, and we'll look at one or two of these, and transform them through the application of quite vivid and direct, you can see it, for instance, in the Woman of the Hat, the sense of, you know, a paint coming right off a palette knife or a brush, scrubbed very vigorously, almost violently, in this uh, area right here. No real attempt made to um, subtly blend or mix or modulate any of that. It's just straight really off the off the palette, maybe even straight out of the of a tube onto the onto the canvas itself. And again, all the usual accusations of incompetence or um, you know, trying to basically um uh, deceive or fraud, uh, you know, pull some kind of fraud in the art viewing public. These things are are um you know, these accusations are made all the time. Um, here's a good example of that, again, traditional subject. If Matisse's portrait is pretty conventional, i.e. going back to the 17th, 17th century in the Dutch mode, uh, his Matisse's Le Bonheur de Vivre, The Joy of Life, basically trades on um, 
the kinds of nudes and landscapes that have been kind of going back all the way to, uh, you could kind of argue all the way back to certainly a Venetian art of the 16th century building on the legacy of Giorgione or, or Titian. And, and this is a fascinating piece in a lot of ways because it, in some important senses, it's very academic. It features the uh, male and female nude uh, grouped in, um, you know, very, shall we say, sculpturesque uh, stances. Um, you know, figures sort of dancing in circles. We have examples of that from Poussin or, um, you know, this kind of image here is typical of hundreds, if not thousands, of pastoral uh, uh, style paintings. Um, however, of course, since it's a Fauvist painting, the sense of brilliant and contrasting and arbitrary color dominates, uh, uh, particularly the sort of framing trees and landscape. But also in the foreground, we can see the same the violent juxtaposition of greens, oranges, blues, and yellows. So that the theme of the joy of life is one that's relatively peaceful and one that's you know soothing in a sense but its presentation is certainly much more um, reactive i guess and i think that matisse one of his great contributions to to european art is a little bit like cezanne in that he tapped into that older tradition but was able at the same time to make it quite uh, contemporary um, and i think as a result he's wound up being one of the most durable and interesting uh, artists of this period. The same thing happens in his Red Room, the harmony in red. And in this, the sense of a interior um, with space and three-dimensional objects and so forth has been greatly reduced to uh, pattern and uh, color. Again, the sense of vivid contrast is very, very strong. Uh, the piece is profoundly conventional with its still life elements you know, it's kind of domestic interior, um, perhaps a, a, a landscape in the upper left corner, but also perhaps probably more likely, honestly, a picture. Um, Matisse is kind of flattening out and two-dimensionalizing, if that's the right word, um, the, uh, the canvas and turning it into a two-dimensional object. And this is really going to be a feature, I think, of... Um, of modern art as we go uh, forward, the sense of transforming the canvas into a two-dimensional object decorated with color and line and things like that, as opposed to a window into space is increasingly strong. We have a number of wonderful examples, uh, especially a landscape uh, from uh, Andre Durain. Um, and this is a great example of this, the mountains at uh, Collioure from 1905. Again, brilliant, shimmering uh, color and vivid uh, gesture line. Very uh, reminiscent in some ways of a number of Vincent van Gogh's landscapes and certainly carrying on to some degree in that um, uh, tradition. It's interesting to note that a number of the Fauvist uh, artists seem to be fascinated with the Mediterranean and Mediterranean landscapes, colors, uh, settings, and, and things like that. And to some degree, Vincent van Gogh, again, is a pioneer in that uh, discovery of the south of France as a place for art making. Um, very evocative, again, also is Andre, <coughs> Andre Durand's uh, dance, very much uh, reminiscent of some of the forms that we saw with uh, Matisse's uh, uh, Joy of Life uh, uh, scene there. If we look just briefly and take a minute to look at expressionism, many of the similar uh, trends are seen. Again, vivid, juxtaposed, con uh, contrasting colors, um, but oftentimes with a darker and more intense sense, perhaps a paranoia or angst is seen in expressionism. Um, and there are any number of potential explanations for this, whether it's somehow inherent to German culture or historical events. I don't think we can ever ultimately prove, but they certainly did not give the kind of uh, joie de vivre, if you will, of Matisse and a number of their works. Um, Emile Nold, for instance, in this ostensibly religious subject, presents us with a kind of um, very uh, direct and dark kind of uh, evocation of the likes of uh, Hieronymus Bosch or something like that. 
I think I'll develop this theme of German Expressionism in another talk very 